All right, so once again, this one might seem a little random. Aren't and, they all with me and you? <laughs> and this one was your call again. And at first, I was hesitant because I was like, what do you say about these two movies? Mm -hmm. But the first thing that caught my attention was, that makes these movies really interesting now, is maybe I just wasn't looking in the right places or hanging out with the right people or what, but I feel like Norm MacDonald has a much different reputation now than he did when these movies came out. His he's his his humor has never changed at all. <laughs> We've just evolved as a species, I guess. Yeah, we had we Norm had was ahead of his around. time. <laughs> 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 we had to evolve around him and now so, and now most people seem to finally get it yeah because i remember ba back in the day a, a lot of people especially the people we knew i remember hearing a lot of people say they just had no idea what he was doing and they thought he wasn't funny at all mm -hmm. and it's like it just turned out that he was doing something completely different <laughs> yeah he was he was definitely ahead of his time <laughs> And he's he's now considered like one of the greatest comedians of all time, like still. Which is hilarious. Which which is pretty everything we're saying about him. You can also pretty much say about Dave Chappelle, which mm -hmm. is interesting. That if Norm Macdonald and Dave Chappelle were in the same movie now, it'd probably do significantly better than Screw did. <laughs> yeah. Hell, you could even throw Danny DeVito in there with his resurgence, and it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah, people are obsessed with Danny DeVito now because of It's Always Sunny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. He's hilarious on It's Always Sunny. You can watch anything from a Cuckoo's Nest video to a Batman Returns video, and all the YouTube comments are about It's Always Sunny. <laughs> it's usually so anyway, I just started blasting. <laughs> I'm waiting for... <laughs> I'm waiting for somebody to do one where they've like photoshopped the Batman mask on him and it's talking about the dude that Batman set on fire in the in the second one in Batman Returns. <laughs> and it's and the and the thing about Danny, that also Danny DeVito has kind of evolved into Nicolas Cage meme territory. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing the thing also that makes Norm Macdonald so great and it's like because it's something you see in, in his comedy now and it's what he's known for and then mm -hmm. you go back to these movies that are 20 years old or older and you can still see it he has this delivery of his jokes because he's because he's a writer on dirty work so you can really see it in dirty work yeah he has this way of delivering his comedy to where it's like he's the only one that's in on the joke but it's funny to us anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's and he's able to do that thing where <laughs> I've seen it widely considered, and you can definitely tell he's like the only comedian to where he can make his joke funnier by blatantly explaining what the punchline is after he's told it. <laughs> like he'll, he'll say a joke, and then he'll just let the laughter rest, and then he'll say, you know, because he's gay or something like that, <laughs> 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 and then suddenly it's funnier. It's always great. I think his, because obviously um, Bob Saget directed Dirty Work. Mm -hmm. enough. <laughs> and I think one of the times this really broke out and people started to realize what he's doing was his bit at the Bob Saget roast where he did like the anti roast. Yeah. And everybody, like it started off with everybody going, what the hell is he doing? And then by the end, everybody was like rolling on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> And then his appearances on Conan are really a uh, good example of this also. Like, if you hear his moth joke, it's, like, one of the things he's most legendary for. <laughs> and, it, and like I said, you can really see that kind of stuff in Dirty Work, because I assume we'll talk about Dirty Work first. Yeah, we can go there first. Because, he, I, it, like, it's just one of those cases where you can see that in the writing, even back in 1998, like, the moment where, like, I feel like in 1998, this would have seemed really stilted, and, like, that's just terrible writing. But when you know his style now, 22 years later, <laughs> it's really hilarious the moment when he's on the phone with the, um, like, the frat boys. Uh -huh. And they're dressed like cops, and he's posing as the another frat boy saying, hey, there's fake cops going around. You better, you know, beat the shit out of them if they come to your door. And then he hangs up and he makes another call. Hello, real cops? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like that's such a that's such a norm joke once you realize what his style is finally. <laughs> yeah. But you could see you could see it's easy to see this movie coming out when it did and people going, This writing is dreadful. <laughs> mm-hmm. But then it's like it just took so long for it to come because this movie did have like like it just kind of came and went and then it actually did end up with like a cult following. Yeah. As people slowly started to realize what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give credit for credit too. I'm sure there, there are people that always know. And there were people that were always fans, but it took a long time to come around to get more people. This may be a weird comparison and a lot of people may, jaws may hit the floor. Is it safe to say that Norm might be this generation's Andy Kaufman? I I want to say I've heard that. Which of, which, of course, is especially appropriate since he played Michael Richards in Man on the Moon. So he's yeah. already been in that territory. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel, like, I feel like he's this generation's Andy Kaufman. Because Andy Kaufman, most of his generation didn't get it. And Andy Kaufman wasn't appreciated till years later. Yeah. Thankfully, Norm didn't die and and got to see all the appreciation. <laughs> yeah. It's also his um, his podcast is a big thing with this also. Have you ever heard his uh, his real jerk segment? I haven't, but I've heard his podcast is great. Yeah, there's there's a running segment where he'll talk most time, most of the time the guest isn't in on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he'll go he'll go through like history and he's got like this whole encyclopedia like knowledge of like these horrible terrible people like albert fish oh i remember you telling me about this and he just ends it with like yeah they were a real jerk (laughs) (laughs) but he he goes through like the whole history of every bad thing they ever did and that guy's a real jerk (laughs) (laughs) and so and sometimes when it's always great when the guest gets it because it kills (laughs) Because they'll have no idea where he's going with, and they'll be going, "Why are you telling me this?" And then he gets to that guy's a real jerk, and then it it just kills. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, about the movie itself, mm-hmm. uh, do you have anything to start off with? <laughs> there's a lot of people like hanging around in it. Yeah, there's there's so many uncredited people. <laughs> yeah. Like Sagan has connections. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I didn't realize too a lot of them that, and he's in it, so it makes sense. But uh, how many Sandler connections there are too? Oh yeah, because you've got Christopher McDonald, you've got Chris Farley, uh, you got the dude from Billy Madison, um, the one that's like that's the most insanely idiotic thing I've heard. I can't remember his name. Yeah, it's Downey. I can't remember what his first name is now. But yeah, <laughs> is, is it Tim? I I don't remember that. Um, but that thing too is um because he he is a he was a writer for Saturday Night Live back in that area. Mm-hmm. And you'll notice a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, like the producers and stuff, line up with the Sandler movies usually too. Yeah. And then of course the Sandler cameo among who who, who are all the cameos? That Farley goes uncredited despite playing a pretty major character. <laughs> John Goodman. And did I uh, um did I remember correctly that this this technically is Farley's official last movie? I'm not sure. It might be. It's this or almost. I'm thinking this came out like right after Almost Heroes, and so this technically was. It might have. Which, if it was, is kind of a fitting end for him because he like rides off into the sunset. Yeah, and sort of. <laughs> <laughs> And he's and he's got that because he obviously he was known for that thing where he can make his voice like really boisterous for just the exact perfect comedic moment. Yeah, and that, that's this character in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, this is. Yeah, I mean, it may have been the last movie, but it's peak Farley. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I love like the little, like the little comedic things that happen, like when he's going on about the dude he lives with at the Y. And yeah. finally, Norm's just like, I don't want to stay at your place. And he's like, okay. Yeah, that, that's and I, I really cracked up at the joke when they're getting ready to fight. 
and Farley's <laughs> at the jukebox, and he's like, what song are you going to play? Street Fight by the Rolling Stones, G7. And the guy's just like, you push G8. <laughs> It's such a simple joke, but it's funny. <laughs> and it's yeah. funny in the way it's delivered. And I think it's because it's Farley is so pumped <laughs> for what he thinks he's done. <laughs> yeah, because there's the whole thing where that, that's that's what I was going to bring up was you were, we were talking about how like big and loud he is and how that was like Farley's thing to be able to always make like it was something that it never dried out with him. He always found a different way to make that funny, his outburst. Yeah. But then there are those moments where he doesn't have to, like the when he he monologues about the why. <laughs> <laughs> there's um, there's running jokes everywhere, mm -hmm. and that's that's the uh, tricky thing about running jokes is you have to make them work every time. And for the most part, this movie pulls it off. Yeah. And usually it's the simplest thing, like the fact that Norm gets thrown around everywhere. Mm -hmm. I like that the I, the dumpster at the beginning is my favorite, so I'm glad it came back once. <laughs> really getting oh, where he just the bounces place. off the lid and falls in. <laughs> 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 There's yeah. also the joke that um, uh, the dude we were just talking about, the Downey guy, um, when he's like having this like spiritual moment. <laughs> But it pays off in two different ways. The first time, it's here's your two dollars right in the middle of it, and then in the other one, everyone's just gone. <laughs> I love how between that and the most insanely idiotic thing, it's like they know he's good with like really drawn out <laughs> jokes. Yeah, that are just him talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then of course that they actually do a couple of levels of that running joke because it's a running joke in itself that he gets thrown around because we get the dumpster bit a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes its own segment of the running joke that he gets thrown out when Artie Lang gets to walk out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like the joke evolves. Oh, another another random person just hanging out in there we forgot to mention was uh, David Ketchner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's probably back before anybody knew like his name. Yeah. You know, which is Kechner, which I learned from Paul Rudd. <laughs> oh, okay. well, thanks, Paul Rudd, for clearing that up for us. There's also some jokes that are like, I mean, you can tell it's 1998, which was a very long time ago, because there's some jokes that would uh, probably make people gasp a little more now than they did back then. Like the fact that the beginning credits aren't even over. And one of the jokes is about a crossing guard that grabs kids' asses as they walk <laughs> <laughs> It's like, see, seeing that now, it's like, holy shit. Not only that, but you start the movie with that kind of joke. <laughs> Another running joke that goes through is uh, Jack Warden's penchant for horse. And that one actually has a payoff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just, uh, it's, in, it's interesting. Um, Jack Warden's already come back into our conversation since we just did Problem Child recently. Yeah. And we're not done with uh, mentioning Problem Child again either when we get to the next movie. Weirdly. Was this was this Jack Warden's last movie? I don't know. He was around until what two thousand six. Oh, was he? I don't remember when he passed. I think that was it. I'm, I'm, I can't remember when the last time was we saw him. But um, there's also jokes talking about Norm being one of the writers. Mm-hmm. And how, like, jokes seem different now than they did then, now that you know his styling. Mm -hmm. And so there's some jokes where it's, like, it's it feels like it's a cliche that's happening. Mm -hmm. Like, like the, the deadbeat boyfriend coming home and his girlfriend's on the balcony throwing his stuff out. Yeah. Something we've seen a billion times. We've seen it a billion times before this, and we saw it a billion times after this. It's one of the oldest cliches in the book. Mm -hmm. But there's a couple of little twists. Because you think, Vlad, you would think, you know, with the credits the writers have, they'd be a little more clever than this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But they just throw in those couple of little tweaks <laughs> where you can tell they they kind of knew they were doing the cliche and they just threw a little thing in. I love how the scene, it's the way the scene starts and the way the scene ends. Mm -hmm. I love him passing by all the people that are wearing his clothes as they walk by. <laughs> <laughs> and, then the, and then the whole punchline to the whole scene is the popcorn machine. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why does he have that, first of all? <laughs> and then just the he always uses Because he always uses popcorn in his pranks. Yeah. 
I love how somehow that's his first resort. <laughs> I don't even know if it's plausible. Like, I'm pretty sure that's not what happens. <laughs> I'm going to highly doubt that, but I don't think the movie cares. <laughs> so, so we shouldn't. I, I don't that. either because it's funny when it happens, but. <laughs> I think it's also because we're built up that it's the popcorn prank, but we don't know how far it's going to go. Like, we think maybe it's shooting out of the tailpipe is going to be it, and then there's just an explosion. <laughs> <laughs> Another person that doesn't really get the comedy meat that they used to, um, and even before they were on the very popular show they were on, their roles in movies were really dying down. Um, I feel like this was one of the last times we got to see Chevy Chase outside of community get anything worthwhile to do in a movie. <laughs> I love yeah. how he's progressively more injured as the movie goes on. <laughs> yeah, he's got one moment that is pure Chevy Chase that is one of my favorite moments in the movie, and it's just there for a split second. And it's <laughs> it's when he's saying, you know, like, oh, yeah, your, your, your dad's going to die. And he's talking about, you know, the whole, like, if I had, you know, place a bet, yeah, he's going to die. And it's like a whole thing. It's a whole conversation. And then Artie Lang's like, well, what's wrong with my dad? And he just goes, hmm? Oh, your dad. <laughs> and then, as, if, as if the conversation had gone anywhere else. <laughs> The conversation <laughs> never left. <laughs> so that, that little hmm is perfect. <laughs> and it's such a, it's like, it's like one of the most Chevy Chase things he ever did. And it's for like a split second. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's one of those things that I really hope Chevy Chase ad-libbed. <laughs> And a, uh, another person we got in here is Don Rickles as the movie theater manager, which is which is another connection because I I had forgotten he was in this until the last time I watched it, which was like a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. But I remembered when we lost Don Rickles, um, Bob Saget and John Stamos did like a whole tribute to him on Kimmel. Yeah, and so I'd forgotten that they like already had an established connection. And um, this character, <laughs> first off, I'm not going to name any names, mm -hmm. but I love the idea of him being a movie theater manager. That's all he is. He's just the manager to these, you know, people that work at the movie theater. They're just there. They don't even want to necessarily be there. They're just there because they need a job. Mm hmm and Rickles runs this place by saying, if I fire you, I will ruin your life. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, this joke was funny before because how over the top it seems, but it's funnier now when you have come into contact with people that are simply managers at a movie theater that feel like they have a significant amount of power. <laughs> yeah. And then there is um, that whole movie theater scene, actually. When they go, they kind of go in Tyler Durden territory before Tyler Durden did, at least in movie four. <laughs> that's, that's another joke. That's another joke that seems very, they're literally just saying the punchline. But it, you could definitely tell that Norm probably wrote this joke. Yeah. When they're watching the movie and it's some porn parody of Men in Black. And the dialogue we hear is, hey, we're men in black. We better have sex with each other. <laughs> and I love that it comes back briefly to, oh, look, there's an alien. We better have sex with it. <laughs> I, I also love how there's no explanation from where, for where it came from. They just happen to have this in movie theater real ready to go. Oh, God. And, and, and I think another little bit of comedy that gets missed with that bit is the freaking like basic PowerPoint looking title card of the porn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Yeah, because we, we don't even see a frame of the movie except for that. <laughs> yeah, that's all we get. <laughs> but that's all we needed. Any more, and it might have helped the joke run stale. Yeah. There's another scene like that that kills me. It's when they're putting the fish in the big house, and we <laughs> hear everything going down, and it doesn't cut away from Norman and Artie Lang. Yeah. <laughs> and their facial expressions don't change. And it keeps escalating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, what is it? He, um, oh no, he got the chainsaw from me, and now he's killing me with my own chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> and they just haven't moved. <laughs> I think, and I think the best, I think the best part of that punchline is after all that, Artie Lang still tries to finish putting the yeah. <laughs> As if it's going to do jack shit. <laughs> and I love that we don't see any of the aftermath except there's a slice in the wall. And whenever they're walking out, they're making like squishing sounds on the floor. There's, a, there's also <laughs> bullet holes in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this, and I love that there's so many different, it, that is, if they had just left that in that, just them hearing the noise, it's already one of the funniest scenes in the movie. It might not be the funniest scene in the movie. Yeah. Actually, it might be. <laughs> but then there's the extra punchline that he wants to finish putting the fish around. <laughs> and then there's still one more punchline of the dude walking in going, I didn't ask for this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I, I love that a scene that funny would normally be ruined by adding more punchlines to it. They added two more punchlines that still work. They may not be as funny as the initial punchline, but they're still really damn funny. Yeah. That's it. That scene all together just works in this beautiful way. It does. <laughs> and, well, you were going to say something? No, I was just saying, oh, man. Well, while we're on the topic of that... <laughs> Do you think, because this movie is so short, it is one hour and 22 minutes. We looked it up. The Screwed is only a minute longer. Yeah, according to Netflix, it's a minute shorter. I'm not sure. Oh. I'm not oh. sure which is its real runtime. But um, the thing is, is um, I feel like a, it's it, the whole idea of the revenge business mm -hmm. is really funny. And it feels like such a gold mine. Yeah. And there's and the movie showed there's so many things you can do with it. But I also feel like a premise like that, you walk a fine line because you could just as easily make a movie about revenge that's not funny at all. Yeah, and there, and there's some stuff that doesn't work as much. Like the whole Rebecca Remain as the bearded lady thing. Mm -hmm. I feel like that doesn't have much of a payoff. It doesn't, but it is also kind of funny in the simplicity that they took with it. Yeah, and I, I and I think the main I think the main showcase is that it's a Rebecca Romain cameo. <laughs> yeah, but I do still think that, and I know I know there's probably only so much you can do with it, but I feel like the concept is so good. Mm -hmm. The movie doesn't have near enough of it. It is such, like, the revenge business itself is such a small fraction of the already very small runtime. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do think it's, it works well enough, especially for a movie like this, um, where your expectations aren't, like, massive or anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. The way it falls into a plot with Christopher McDonald. Yeah. But I do still wish we had, like, like a bigger fraction of it was just them doing the revenge business. I think it's funny, too. Like, it cracked me up that all this stuff happens. Like, they have two weeks to get the money. And it feels like months of stuff happens. And it's only been, like, four days. <laughs> How do you feel about... We were talking about jokes that would probably be a bigger deal now. And I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not saying the whole thing of they couldn't do that today. I'm just saying that they'd probably be a bigger deal than they mm -hmm. are. Um, the prison rape joke is so nonchalant. Yeah. <laughs> given, th given that it actually happens to him. <laughs> <laughs> 
And this was, it's just, it's weirdly timed too, because this movie came out the same year as American History X. <laughs> yeah. And you saw how that became a whole, that changed the entire movie of American History X. <laughs> Let's also talk about the fact that when he's, I guess you could call it monologuing about it, we never get any cuts or changes in camera angle. We stay in that <laughs> shot for a good while. <laughs> Like, for for a comedy starring Norm MacDonald, directed by Bob Sackett, there's a lot of, like, long takes. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like Sackett put on his Tarantino hat for a minute. <laughs> uh, I would have never thought about it that way, but now that you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> uh. And I do, I do love though how nonchalant like the dark jokes are. Like how the the literally the very last line of the movie mm -hmm. is, well, Chevy Chase, we gave him the money, but the book is still beat to death, so he's dead. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. That sounds like me simplifying it. That's the actual closing line for Beta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what do you um? So do you, do you, I don't know, do you think the movie takes a dip when we get into the Crystal McDonald plot? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I know Crystal McDonald is gold, especially when he's playing a villain in a comedy, as we know. <laughs> this is, this is the comparison I was going to tell, that I'm telling you about, that I was telling you about earlier. Everybody sit down and calm down. <laughs> to me, Christopher McDonald as a comedy villain does for me what Michael Shannon does as a dramatic villain. <laughs> I think he's just the best. He's just, he's just born for it. <laughs> he is. He absolutely is. And I, I hope in real life that he's a wonderful dude because on, in a film, he is excellent at playing scum. I heard that. I heard this story. And I think I think I told this when I reviewed Happy Gilmore like seven years ago. So I think it's time we can tell it again. Mm -hmm. I heard a story once, and I have no idea if it's true or not. Because this was on the internet, so I have no idea whatsoever if this is true or not. But I want so badly for it to be true that I'm going to believe that it is. Okay. Supposedly somebody saw Christopher McDonald at an airport. Mm-hmm. And they went up to him, and he was being very standoffish. And he was uh -huh. like, like he, he just didn't want to be around anybody. Yeah. And he was just seemed like in a really bad mood. And he was so he, but he was still like, all right, I'll sign your autographs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then as they walked away, he said something under his breath. And, they, and then they were like, what, I didn't, what was that? And then he said, I said, go back to your shanties. And he was. So he was doing that encounter in character. <laughs> I said, that's probably absolute bullshit, but I hope it's true. <laughs> uh, I love the fact that his character, <laughs> I believe every scene he's in, he's with his dog. Yeah. That's, that's one of the running jokes I could take or leave. The, he may or may not be fucking his dog, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny it's it's a funny thing to discuss but <laughs> like, i think it's so simple but i think one of christopher mcdonald's funniest lines in this movie is when he's talking about the homeless and he's like we all know how i feel about the homeless they're people <laughs> and they're homeless <laughs> yeah it is like because that's another one of those things where on the surface it looks like he's just playing one of those cliche villains. Mm -hmm. But it's also, you get the sense that he's like doing a parody of that kind of villain intentionally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Christopher McDonald doesn't get near the credit he deserves for what he brings to the table in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's... Shooter McGavin's a freaking legend, but I mean... <laughs> So whether it's legit serious stuff like Dumb on Louise or whether it's Shooter McGavin, he can do it. <laughs> yeah. he's Christopher McDonald is rapidly approaching that territory for me where if he's in it, I'll give it a shot and watch it. 
which is a shame because usually his smart his his parts are like really small. <laughs> yeah. But he but he he really owns whatever that small screen time. Is. He makes the most of whatever he's doing. I, I always forget he's Elijah Wood's dad in the faculty for like thirty seconds. <laughs> yeah. I always remember when we when uh back, back way back in the trailer for Grind. I always got a kick out of the he has one line in the trailer and it's get the moron out of the pool and the way he delivers it is perfect. And it's pro- it's probably the line from Grind I hear the most still. <laughs> like whenever whenever I hear Grind referenced at all anymore these days, it's always that one. <laughs> But yeah, it's like we were saying though. Um, even if a punchline is weak, mm-hmm. or a punchline kind of falls flat, usually more often than not, Farley just pops up in the scene to finish the scene out and make it worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, like the whole, like the whole hookers in the trunk joke is funny to an extent, mm-hmm. but then it's just like, all right, I guess that's the joke. And then when Farley sees it on TV and then shows up, <laughs> it says, like, wake up, or then it feels like the scene has a true punchline. <laughs> so I, was, I would say that's, is that dirty work in a nutshell? Did we cover everything? I think so. Oh. I, I mean, like I told you, I hadn't seen it in a long time, and I forgot just how funny it is. And I agree with you. It's probably funnier now than it would have been if I would have watched it 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, a, it's, a, it's one that Owen always wanted me to do as this. Mm-hmm. But I just kind of ignored him because I was like, how do you talk about dirty work for more than a couple of minutes, if that? Well, we did it for we got- about 30. So. <laughs> All right. So um, should we move on? Yeah. Okay, here's a, here's another movie where it's like I never when we started this I never in a million years thought this movie would come up. <laughs> in that uh, way they're perfectly matched. Yeah. <laughs> but interestingly enough, as off the radar and not talked about as it may seem, we brought this movie up a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Because the writers and directors have the weirdest career <laughs> one could possibly see. <laughs> yeah. The guys that wrote Ed Wood, Man on the Moon, there that is again, and um, the Beale versus Larry Flint, they're like the master of the biopic. Wrote and directed this movie for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason and the reason we've mentioned them recently is because they also wrote the Problem Child movies for some reason. Yeah. And to my understanding, this is the only time they've gone into directing territory. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like in this one, they wrote it. Mm-hmm. And we talked about the fact that Norm was a writer on Dirty Work, so you could really see it in that. And I could I'm trying to figure out when I watch Screwed if Norm had input, added his own things, or if these guys kind of tried to write Norm. Mm -hmm. And if there's, because there's some stuff that definitely feels like they're Norm's thing and something he could have come up with himself. And then there's a lot of stuff that's just there. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So just right off the bat, right away, even though we're dealing with writers that are extremely skilled, it's weird that whenever they do a biopic, there they also I believe they also wrote Dolomite. Dolomite is my name. Mm. So they've obviously really mastered that territory. But it seems like every time they write a comedy, there are they do not get a good reception at all. Mm. It's really bizarre. It's also worth noting. Um, obviously, you mentioned that they wrote Ed Wood. Um, did you see Glenn or Glenda go by? when they're flipping through Dan DeVito's TV at the end. Yeah. <laughs> of course. So um, what's your overall opinion on Screwed? It's, it's no dirty work. Do you remember the fact that we saw this at the theater? Yes. I'm trying, to re- I'm trying to remember why or how that happened. 
<laughs> and there I were don't like, know. there were like it was I think it was early into its run, and there were only two people in there with us. This movie did terribly. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's like you said, is crazy because nowadays it'd probably kill with Norm, uh, Dave Chappelle, and Danny DeVito headlining. Yeah. <laughs> And and you know, Norman Chappelle would get like so much like leeway, like leeway to work with. Yeah. And so, like, they would be, they basically be doing their own thing the whole time. <laughs> yeah. And you can definitely tell this is them working with somebody else's writing. What's um? What's is, is there a significance to the joke where everybody's name? is slightly like a president's. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like I feel like, I feel like there's <laughs> there's some sort of hidden payoff to that, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but um so the center we talk about those three and of course another center of this movie is, is Elaine Stritch. Mm-hmm. Um who has some pretty perfect deliveries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah who is um who just in general had an amazing career um like probably one of my favorite documentaries that i've seen mm-hmm. is the one about her uh which is called shoot me mm-hmm. it's it's like really incredible and really shows you just how much like impact in the comedy world she had <laughs> yeah um and, and that and that character in particular also where they're playing up on like the really rich I don't give a fuck sort of character. Yeah. We have the moment when she's kidnapped by Grover towards the end and she's clipping fucking coupons. <laughs> <laughs> and I also I also love that there's a full on reveal in this scene. Mm-hmm. You you've you've managed to bring Tarantino into dirty work. I'll bring it into I'll bring him into screwed because there is a movie he made much later after this that has a similar reveal. <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice whenever she's walking around, when Miss Grock is walk, walking around, she has a cane and she like walks like that. Mm-hmm. But when Grover breaks into the house, she ditches the cane completely and runs up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like, wow, that is so revealing about her character. <laughs> and there's no dialogue about it. Yeah. It's like she's, I mean, we already know she's full of shit in a certain way, but that mm-hmm. just shows that it's on a whole other level than is even a dress. <laughs> yeah. She's, as they, as they, as they would say in wrestling, she lives the gimmick. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's something else you can say about this movie that Dirty Work didn't go that much into. I mean, there was the joke where Artie Lang pisses on the guy. Mm-hmm. And probably a couple of other things, but um, this movie's definitely much more in the gross-out area. Yeah. But e- even before we meet Grover, when we just go full-on gross-out territory, where we get, th- we, get that whole, we get that whole scene devoted to his little collection that he finds in Dead Bodies, which... I do think goes on way too long. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That feels like maybe a couple of, like, that feels like it was half a deleted scene. Like how you have those, like how you have those um, deleted scenes on special features on a DVD where it's like, more often than not, there are scenes that are in the movie, they're just longer versions. Yeah. I feel like this scene was definitely supposed to be one of those, but somehow the whole scene ended up in it. And like I said, when you've got a runtime this short, that kind of show scenes like that kind of show when you're running out of gas. Yeah. When you're doing scenes like that that go on way too long or you're starting to rely on gross out factor. So I've got to say, I had to look up what, I remember this came out in 2000. I had to look up which date it was mm-hmm. to determine what age I was. And so I was nine when we saw this in theaters. Yeah. And I sub- I can I feel I I was hoping I could appreciate it now, for how unexpected and over the top it is. But it still feels like overkill, and I don't know if it's in a good way. Mm-hmm. When I was nine, and we went to see a comedy with that drunk guy from Billy Madison, that's probably what I knew Norm from at the yeah. time. It's and I was a squeamish kid. Mm-hmm. 
It scared the holy shit out of me when the dog bites him and he bleeds everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I was hoping I could appreciate just how over the top that is now. But I watch it now and I'm still like, that is that is way over the top. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and it's and it's stuff like that where it's like I gonna I. If you do it right, gross out humor can work. Mm -hmm. But this movie has no middle ground. When it goes for the gross out factor, it goes all the fuck in. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> like I said, especially when, and the whole, the dog biting him thing is long before Grover's introduced. And Gro Grover is just a nonstop gross out joke. <laughs> yeah. Now, but of course, Danny DeVito has his own moments of gold in this. Outside of that, I love his obsession with Hawaii Five O and Jack Lord. I love that. It, I love that he is wearing a Bookum Dano shirt the first time we meet him, which mm -hmm. means that that joke is foreshadowed. <laughs> 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 but secondly. I would go so far as to say, I've, I've been critical of this movie's style of humor up to this point. Mm -hmm. Apart from the Miss Croc jokes. But, I feel like, and this might sound hyperbolic, but I don't care. The fact that Grover not only loves Hawaii Five-0, but that he is president of the Jack Lord fan club. Mm-hmm. And we hear his answering machine, answering machine message state this might be one of the funniest jokes ever put to film. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know because that's one of those cases where you want to ask why. And obviously, you know, like the rant because it's random style of humor is pretty played out. Mm -hmm. But seriously, the fact that there is no why. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that that joke just is makes it a perfect joke <laughs> because he doesn't he doesn't act like jack lord we don't get built up to this apart from his shirt that goes on un, nothing is said about it mm -hmm. it's just kind of a perfect joke <laughs> <laughs> And then there's the whole thing when it's like, oh no, I've got to hide. And the, the, the bed just goes into the wall. And there's and that's funny in itself, that he just hides inside the wall. But that there's giant pictures of Jack Lord everywhere. <laughs> I love how, like, the way that it's ingrained into his character, it's almost less of a joke and more characterization. <laughs> Why is somebody like him so heavily armed? <laughs> I because I feel like when they show up in the cop car and he's like, "You'll never take me alive," and he starts shooting at them. Mm -hmm. Why do I get the idea this is not the first time he's been through this? <laughs> he works at the morgue. <laughs> well, they also bring up that it's a shitty neighborhood. <laughs> Did you did you notice there's even moments where like when he's open when he's like pulling out the slabs when he's looking for a dead body, he's he's literally making his penguin noises. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's so obvious. <laughs> it is kind of funny too the option that he goes with with uh, the body that he chooses that's supposed to look like Norm, <laughs> and the fact that it's one of those things where like there's a la there's another layer added. Because you see his appearance first with the big white beard, and then they're like, hey, why is he a midget? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's kind of the thing I want to go into now, which is the, there's times where it makes the movie, there's times where jokes do succeed. Mm -hmm. But with the plot that this movie has, because one of the things I mentioned to you was if, there, if there's one problem this movie might have is it, it's probably it's pacing. Because the movie is so short. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is an hour and 21 minutes. 
and that includes credits. So it's probably like an hour and 15 minutes. It barely reaches feature length. Mm -hmm. So the thing about that is so it feels like so much happens in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> this movie does not feel that short. <laughs> But talking about all the stuff that happens in this movie, and maybe you maybe you'll have an argument for this against this. But with the plot that this movie has, the whole idea, like the whole setup of the idea, is that everybody's dumb. Yeah. yeah everybody's a complete idiot. It's like the it's like the burn after reading setup. Mm -hmm. Like you got all this stuff going on, all this plot, but that's the joke. They're all fucking dumb. If this was a Coen Brothers movie, Clooney would be Norm. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, is actually Chad Feldheimer might be Norm. Because he's, he's the one that gets the whole idea. He's the idea, man. <laughs> no, true. If you can call it that. <laughs> but the thing is, it actually, start, I'm come to think of it, it's weird how much this movie has in common with Burn After Reading. Because <laughs> <laughs> Elaine Stretch would be Malkovich. <laughs> yeah. It's like the Coen Brothers watched Screwed and they were like, you know what? We could do better. This is, this is a sentence I never thought I'd say. Francis McDormand would be Dave Chappelle. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's the one that's just kind of doing her job and gets roped up in it. <laughs> does, that make, does that make Brad Pitt Grover? That's what I'm saying. I think Brad Pitt is normal in this scenario. I don't know. Who the, <laughs> but I guess, I guess he'd be a combination of the two. <laughs> mm -hmm. but the thing is is even though that works so well for burn after reading because the coens are such clever writers mm -hmm. i was wondering if this movie might work better like what this movie would look like and if they could find better jokes if the characters were smart mm. and they just and they just kept getting they were smart people that kept getting themselves getting themselves in stupid situations mm if there might be more jokes there because there because there's always stuff where it just kind of feels like a cop out or lazy writing and you, and you could say it's the joke but that kind of thing doesn't really work as well here as it would in something like say dirty work mm -hmm. where like um the whole like the whole thing with sarah silverman when it's like when it, whenever they need her it's just like well i'll just do this thing and it's like oh yeah we had a little sex and she said yes and then that's the joke mm -hmm. But it's like it just—that felt less like a joke that works, and more like, a, no, we we just needed to get from point A to point B, and we didn't know how to do that. So here is a, an attempt at a joke, I guess. Mm. <laughs> so it's like I feel like if they had found a smarter way in and out of these situations, the movie would be stronger and probably more rememberable. Mm -hmm. um, but as is, I don't know. But there is some stuff where them being dumb makes like it excels. Mm -hmm. Like the interrogation scene, <laughs> when they they just do not have their story straight. They're all saying different things. <laughs> <laughs> Chappelle can't remember if his truck was impounded or not. <laughs> <laughs> the it's movie like, tries uh, to have running jokes too, like Chappelle hitting people with lamps. I think that works simply because, like I was saying, that I feel like if they if the jokes were smarter, they'd be more memorable. Mm -hmm. but i still to this day I, in any given circumstance i can still say i was scared like he does mm -hmm. i still say that <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it's not one of those things where you remember the line but forget the movie because the line works and the movie doesn't no i remember what movie it is i remember what scenes it comes from <laughs> <laughs> Because I, lo I love the final payoff. <laughs> it's a fucking lava lamp. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's such a, like, that's a great way of you get one joke, then the joke comes back. Then once you've established a running joke, you do it in a really over-the-top way. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that stuff kind of works. And I do, and I do like speaking of Sarah Silverman. She does have a, a line that I like that we wouldn't be able to have if they weren't the characters that they were and they weren't the way they were. Mm -hmm. It's after it's it's at the very end when they're at Grover's place and all the cops show up and they've got their guns aimed and Sarah Silverman just runs up to them and says, "No, don't shoot. They're stupid and confused." <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, I I do wonder. This movie just leaves me wondering, like, like if we'd have a better movie of either the right. I can't. T- do I want the characters to be smarter, or do I just want the writing to be smarter? Because, like I said, when you have the Cullen brothers writing a movie like this, you get burnt after reading, which mm-hmm. is a brilliant movie about really stupid people. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this could have been eight years. They had eight. They had an eight year jump on the Cullen brothers. Mm-hmm. They could have made Burn After Reading before Burn After Reading, but they just didn't hit the mark completely. Mm-hmm. So maybe it is just smarter writing I'm looking for, but like I said, this this could have been Burn After Reading before Burn After Reading, and when you look at it like that, it kind of looks like the the ball was dropped somewhere. Do you think? Do you think it could have been improved on if they just had Norm write it? possibly because his because that, because that's one of those things too where like his right his comedy seems so basic like you can say like he just says the most mundane punchline but just his delivery sells it mm-hmm. and it's like but that but the way he does it is so smart because of the way he makes it work even though it's just such a it can be such a mundane punchline mm-hmm and it's, sometimes it's when he just whips out stuff that's so unexpected, especially in the environment. Like there is, um, there was an interview that he did with like he and Sandler and a whole bunch of the others, like Rob Schneider and David Spade and all them and Nick Sports, and we're all doing like a comedy tour, mm-hmm. and they were all on Conan at the same time. And he was saying like um, he was telling a story about David Spade, and he said, um, "Now I'm not one for charity," and he leaned back in his chair as he said that. Mm-hmm. And, then he, and then Conan said why did you turn into Mark Twain just now <laughs> and then amidst the laughter of that you hear Norm say you're over here comparing me to Hal Holbrook and Conan every, while everybody's laughing at what Conan said Conan loses his shit at Norm saying Hal Holbrook because it's such a deep cut <laughs> and Conan's like the only person that caught it <laughs> like, in that environment you don't expect him to acknowledge that Hal Holbrook was like really famous for playing Mark Twain for a period of time <laughs> and he whipped that out just right there on the spot <laughs> and it's like who in that crowd is going to get a Hal Holbrook reference <laughs> and so, it's, so it's like he can do like really smart humor in the most unexpected environment and it can work you're just not going to catch it right away so i could so it probably would have been the same thing as dirty work if he wrote this movie it probably would have been completely shit on but nowadays it'd be considered a classic Hmm. but but nowadays with screwed like the fact that screwed is on netflix is probably the first time anybody's heard about it in forever <laughs> i mean i just it was on like when it first came out on the movie like we saw it in the theater and then when it came out on the movie channels i remember watching it a lot like the first like the watching it on netflix was probably the first time i'd seen it in over a decade well probably well over a decade mm-hmm. and I, st- I still remember like all the beats and all the lines and i was scared and all that other stuff <laughs> so some something stuck with me but Look, let's at, talk about how funny it is that you, you went to Netflix to find Screwed. And I watched Dirty Work on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Not even subscription YouTube. It was like, hey, let us throw a couple ads in here and you can have this shit for free. Yeah, the same thing for when you go to its IMDb page, the first thing you'll see is a big yellow bar that says watch for free on YouTube or on IMDb TV or whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> you can find Dirty Work for free fucking anywhere. And I just, and I own it, and I don't remember when I got it. I just had it forever. I love that you just whipped it out. <laughs> yeah, it just it just materialized on my shelf one day. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't own Screwed because you just don't see it laying around. It yeah. just disappeared. <laughs> you don't even see it at like flea markets or the exchange or anything like that. Yeah, because if, if it was at a flea market, I would have it by now. How do you think I have a collection this big? <laughs> Fucking flea markets did this. <laughs> so, um, is that is that screwed? Is that it? I, I think so. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, I think we determined that 
dirty work is probably the the one that holds up more certainly. And so it's like we said, Screw kind of fell off the radar, whereas Dirty Work found a cult following. Yeah. Heavily. So it's it's pretty clear. And it's like we were saying, if Norm had taken part in writing Screwed, I do wonder if it would have done the same thing as Dirty Work and kind of found its way back around. But I wonder if Dirty Work's initial I I guess you would call it failure initially when it came out i wonder yeah. if that's why we never got any other movies about like people having a revenge business yeah because that yeah, sounds it, like a that sounds like a comedic setup for the ages yeah you, you can actually see the cult following when you talk about it not being a success at first mm -hmm. bob saget has a stand-up special mm -hmm. where he name drops dirty work where he's like yeah i directed a movie called dirty work and then he told like a story but when he said i directed a movie called dirty work the crowd cheered uh-huh saga just said where were all of you opening weekend i kind of i, I kind of wish that bob saget would have made an appearance in the movie because i feel like him and his brand of comedy would have fit there yeah, because it, it, it could have been similar to his uh, cameo in Half Baked. <laughs> yeah. Just, just I, there for one memorable line and then disappear. <laughs> I tell you, a character that he probably could have done if they didn't get him to do it, if for some reason Chevy Chase couldn't do it, I could see Bob Saget playing the Doctor. Yeah. I love that. I love that moment coming back to the Doctor. There's one moment I forgot that Chase has. It's, it's so – it's funny in how dark it is mm -hmm. when he's like um, – hey, man, we're going to get you the $50,000 and you're going to be fine. And he, like, starts to cry because he's going to live. And then he's like, I mean, that's, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's fucked up because we know he dies anyway. <laughs> I also love the little moment where we're already back to dirty work. I love the – I think it's because we kind of shortchanged Chevy Chase and just how funny his character is. But I love the scene. It's such a simple joke, but I love the way it's done where he walks in with the stethoscope to check on Jack Warden. And Jack Warden's like, if that stethoscope is as cold as it is yesterday, I'm going to shove it up your ass. And Chevy Chase just looks at the nurse and goes, yeah, everything's the same, and just leaves. <laughs> so I think if there, if, if there was any other way we needed to determine that Dirty Work is the more memorable movie. It's the fact that we've circled back around to it, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know what we're going to tackle next. We've got some We've got some options. Yeah, there, there was one we almost did before this, and then once, you, once we mentioned this one, you were like, yeah, we have to do that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um... Yeah, it'll probably be it'll probably be in the realms of nostalgia again. Yes, especially if it's that one we almost did. Yeah, but if it's the one I'm thinking, I'll go ahead and do my dropping of the hint. Um, I'll be out of town this weekend, but on Monday, I'll be bound for home, and then we'll put out another video on Wednesday. I don't, I don't, I don't have anything else. <laughs> like we're good. That, that, uh, when you come back, is it going to be an incredible journey? <laughs> it might be. It might be. Thankfully I'm staying East. So I don't have any chance of getting lost in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> but. All right. Then, uh, is that going <laughs> to, yeah. So I guess, I guess Wednesday we're talking about Scoob. <laughs> ah. <laughs> all right we're done here <laughs> yeah i got nothing else <laughs>